Today I'm going to be getting into the book In the Time of the Butterflies by Julia Alvarez. Now, for those who don't know, this is a historical fiction. It's written from the point of view of real historical figures. Those are the Maribel sisters, otherwise known as the Butterflies. They lived in the Dominican Republic in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. They died in 1960. They are seen as national heroes down there because they are known as figureheads of the political movement that ultimately brought down Rafael Trujillo, the dictator down there. He ruled over the country for a number of decades. Now, usually I would save the takeaways, the conclusions from any book for the end of the book review, but for this one in particular, it's a little bit different. The author actually made it really easy for the takeaway to be understood by including a postscript at the end of the book, giving some information about the author's life, the author's relation to these events, and literally spelling out her purpose for writing and what she hopes the reader would take away from this, her intended audience would take away from this. She was born in 19 so she would have been 10 years old when the Mirabel sisters died and 11 years old when Trujillo died. Her father was part of one of the cells, one of the local groups that comprised the resistance movement against Trujillo. And she writes that somebody else in her father's resistance cell got put into prison and everybody knew that that person would be tortured until they gave up the names of everyone else they knew. So her father had no choice but to flee the country, left Dominican Republic, went to New York in August of 1960, and that that's where Alvarez spent a lot of time. So given that context of her life, these events are pretty personal for her. I'm going to read out some direct quotes from that postscript because I think they're useful for setting the tone as we go into the plot. Quote, During that terrifying 31-year regime, any hint of disagreement ultimately resulted in the death for the dissenter and often the members of his or her family. But the Mirabels had risked their lives. I kept asking myself, what gave them that special courage? It was to understand the question that I began this story. But as happens with any story, the characters take over beyond polemics and facts. They become real to my imagination. I began to invent them. And so it was that what you find in these pages is not the Mirabel sisters of fact or even the Mirabel sisters of legend, but the actual sisters I never knew, nor did I have have access to enough information or the talents or inclinations of a biographer to be able to adequately record them. As for the sisters of legend wrapped in superlatives and ascended into myth, they were also inaccessible to me. I realized too that such deification was also dangerous. The same god-making impulse had also created our tyrant. Ironically, by making them myth, we lost the Mirabels once more, dismissing the challenge of their courage as impossible for us ordinary men and women. So what you will find here are the Mirabels of my own creation, made up, but I hope, true to the spirit of the real Mirabels, end quote. And then an interesting addition to this, a quote from a little later in that same postscript, quote, I wanted to immerse my readers in an epic in the life in the Dominican Republic that I believe could only find finally be understood through fiction, could only finally be reduced by the imagination. A novel is, after all, not a historical document, but a way to travel through the human heart." End quote. And something interesting she says in this postscript, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to go over this before we get into the plot, she directly says that she altered the chronology on some of these historical events to better capture the feeling of what it was like to live during this time, which, for creating a novel, for the purposes of creating something in this art medium. I support that stylistic choice, but it's something we need to be aware of going in because I will be, at least to the best of my ability, going over some of the historical context behind the things that are mentioned in this book. So the story starts out from Dede's point of view. Dede is the second oldest sister, and she's the last surviving sister. The other three are the ones that died in 1960. Dede survived years longer. She died in 2014. This book itself was published in 1994, so Dede would have been alive for 20 years after the book was published. And the way Dede lived her later years was she stayed in that same family home that was in the same neighborhood all the sisters grew up in. She did focus a lot on her family, which included also raising the children of her deceased sisters. But among other things, her home was very close to the national monument to these sisters. So pretty much all the time tourists would come, they would see the monument, and they would drive five minutes down the road to the house, and they would come and ask Dede questions about it. And I do have Dominican friends who have pictures of themselves standing next to today. I know people that met her, so she was accessible enough. I have every reason to believe Alvarez actually interviewed Dede for this book. I tried looking around online. I cannot find confirmation of that. 
So the book opens from Dede's perspective in 1994, shows her living in that house and getting a visit from some foreign American reporter. Doesn't understand how Dominican time and Dominican schedules work. She wants an exact time for the meeting, doesn't know to just let you know, hey, I'll be over later, and then just show up at a convenient time. Also is a little surprised when there's no street names and the way to give directions in that area is just give landmarks. And I think the author gave those examples to illustrate the attention that this story got from foreign people who don't understand the local area. And it also a little bit creates the feeling of the sister's memory being sort of a carnival attraction, just something for tourists to gawk at rather than caring about who they actually were. And something else the book mentions that Dede gets scared when the reporter closes the car door too loudly, quote, and I'm not the only one, Dede thinks. Any Dominican of a certain generation would have jumped at that gunshot sound, end quote. So we open up with this scene of the American reporter with the sort of foreign, choppy English accent, Spanish, asking today questions about the family, uh, asking about the pictures on the wall. And this is where we get the segue into telling the girl's story as flashbacks from when they were alive from their point of view. The flashback opens up in the 1930s, and it is from Minerva's point of view. Minerva is the third sister. She was born in 19. 1926, today was born in 1925, and it describes the family dynamic how the older sister, Patria, born in 1924, wants to be a nun, so she wants to study and get religious schooling. So Patria begs the mom, the mom begs the dad, and ultimately the dad gives in, despite not feeling comfortable with the girls being out of the house. I should mention that the school they end up going to is a Catholic boarding school, so they would be sleeping away from home. I actually don't know if that was the only school available. It might have been. So the three girls end up going to that school, and meanwhile the fourth girl, Maria Teresa, they call her Mate, she was born in 1935, so nine years younger than Minerva, and at least according to the book, it says that the father wanted to try one last time because he wanted at least one boy, but whoops, fourth one is also a girl. But since she was so much younger, she was too young to go to school at that time, so she ended up staying home. Now, the town they grew up in is called Ojo de Agua. The English translation of that is Eye of the Water. It's a little bit east of the nearest big city, which is Santiago. I've actually been to Santiago, and that's where the nearest big airport is. This town is a bit southeast of Puerto Plata, which today is a big tourist destination. And it's an hour or two drive north from La Vega, which is where the school is. Quote from Minerva's point of view, I realized that I had just left a small cage to go into a bigger one, the size of our whole country." End quote. The story goes from Minerva's point of view, that is the third sister. She makes a friend at school, the friend's name is Sunita. Minerva tells Sunita, hey, I have a secret for you. Tells her about getting her first period, and Sunita, in exchange, tells her another secret, that is the secret of Trujillo. It turns out Sunita's uncles used to work with Trujillo, but they stopped liking him because they saw some of the bad things that he did. And one thing led to another, and the uncles were killed. Turns out they were trying to plan a coup. Later on, Sunita's father and her brother were also killed, because they were working against the government. It turns out, at least according to this girl, at least in the context of this novel, Trujillo worked his way up the ranks of the military, and he ended up getting a lot of promotions because his superiors were mysteriously killed. In one case, there was even a commanding officer who was with somebody else's wife, but the husband mysteriously found out what was going on, and he came home early, and the husband killed that officer. Funny how that happens. He rose up one position after another, until eventually he found himself as head of the armed forces. And then one day, the elected president goes off to Puerto Rico, and Trujillo declares himself leader of the country. All this is according to Sinita in the book. Now, I looked up the actual history of this. There is a little bit more context. In the year 1916, now I found this interesting because it's just before the U.S. got involved in World War One, And I also find it interesting because growing up in an American school, this isn't something I heard about. In 19 1916, the U.S. sent military to occupy the Dominican Republic because the nation for a number of decades had one revolution after another and it was very unstable, so they were trying to impose order there. And as part of that, they organized a National Guard, which comprised of a lot of locals. Trujillo, of course, joined this. According to what I could find, U.S. Marines trained these people. I could not find anything about all the alleged killings of his superior officers, but I did find that 1924 was the year, eight years after this 
National Guard was formed and six years after Trujillo joined it. 1924 was the year that he was named Commander of the National Police, and then four years later he was named Brigadier General. There was a coup in 1930, but it wasn't as simple as just Trujillo taking power. There were actual elections involved. However, these elections weren't the best. Because Trujillo still had command of the army, he used that to his advantage. And when I tell you that he won 99% of the vote, you can probably guess at some of the things that went on. And something else funny I found. The American ambassador at the time wrote a letter back to the State Department telling them that Trujillo received more votes than there were actual voters. I've never heard of anything like that going on. But back to the fictional story. Trujillo actually visits the school in La Vega, and he takes an interest in one of the older girls there. Her name is Lina. Pulls her aside, talks to her, shows her all the medals. Ooh, ah, impressive. Do you want to touch them? Ooh, ah. Starts sending gifts to this girl, and also gives gifts to the nuns to keep them quiet. Lina starts falling in love, and Trujillo actually throws her a big 17th birthday party. But then one day, she just leaves the convent and just doesn't come back. They find out later, of course, that she went to live in one of Trujillo's many mansions that he has throughout the island. Quote, he's got many girlfriends all over the island, set up in big houses. Lina Lavaton is just a sad case because she really does love him. Pobrecita. End quote. Now, in the book, at least, Lina gets pregnant, and Trujillo's wife gets jealous and tries to have her killed. Trujillo then sends her to live in Miami, Florida to be safer. And then, of course, he moves on to the next one. Now, I did look this up. I was able to find a few pictures of her online without a lot of other information. The non-fictional Lena Leviton was born around 1920, whereas Minerva was born in 26, so that would match the age of the character in this novel. I found some sources that call her a wife of Trujillo and some sources that just call her a partner. Most sources agree that she did have two children with him. There's not a lot of information I could find. I have a feeling that the reason for my not finding a lot is I'm using English language Google and I don't have access to as many primary source authentic Dominican documents for this. But as far as this story goes with this character, it might have happened that way. I don't know. The year is 1944, and the country's Independence Day is February 27th. It's the centennial celebration, so it's 100 years since the country gained its independence. And, you know, they celebrate with all the pomp and circumstance. They get new history textbooks, with Trujillo's face printed on the front of every one. El Jefe generously donates money to the school to pay for the construction of the new Lina Leviton Auditorium. And schools all across the nation have contests to see which one can put on the best patriotic play to celebrate the centennial. And what do you know, Minerva's school just happens to win the regional competition for that. And as a reward, oh boy, oh boy, they get to go to the capital and perform their play alongside all the other schools that won their regionals. They all get to perform their plays in front of El Jefe himself, Trujillo. Now Minerva, Sunita, and friends, after they saw what happened to Lena, they are not excited about doing this. But what they plan to do is one of the props in the play is a fake bow and arrow. And Sunita, the one who's supposed to be holding this fake bow and arrow, plan plans to aim the bow at Trujillo in the audience when it comes to that part of the play. And hey, what, what do you know? It, that's not a good idea. She does this, and Trujillo's son walks up on stage, takes the bow, and breaks it, and then make a big show of humiliating Sunita. Minerva has to stop it by starting a Viva Trujillo chant. Now, on to the next chapter, on to the next sister's point of view. That's the interesting thing about how this book is written. It rotates between all the sisters having their own points of view, and the thing I like, the nice touch that gets put on the character of Maria Teresa, the youngest one, Mate, is all of her chapters are written to a diary, not just written as a narrative. So the chapter starts when Mate is 10 years old and she starts going to school. Minerva, of course, is nine years older than her at the same school, and she starts sneaking out of school for one reason or another. Minerva makes up excuses like she's going to visit family or something like that, and Mate gets in the habit of lying to protect her sister. Until eventually Mate finds out that Minerva is going to political meetings, and I think you can probably guess what kind of political meeting she's at. Quote, I asked Minerva why she was doing such a dangerous thing, and then she said the strangest thing. She wanted me to grow up in a free country. Isn't it that already, I asked? Minerva didn't answer me. End quote. Mate learns more about what Minerva's doing and why she's doing it. Quote, now that I know something I'm not supposed to know, 
everything looks just a little different. I see a guard and I think, who have you killed? I hear a siren and I think, who's going to be killed? See what I mean? I see the picture of our president with eyes that follow me around the room and I'm thinking he's trying to catch me doing something wrong, end quote. And also during Mate's chapter, it describes one of Minerva's friends named Hilda, someone who also does political activities, of course. As a last resort to avoid getting arrested, she asks the nuns at the school, the ones who teach the school, if she can hide in the convent, disguise herself as a nun to avoid the secret police. The nuns agree to do it and she hides out for a while, but eventually she is caught and at that point, both Mate and Minerva have to bury, hide, destroy a lot of their papers, and that includes Mate's little diary, the little book that she writes to, and that her chapter is told as if we're reading the pages of her diary. Next chapter is Patria. Patria, of course, being the oldest one, born two years before Minerva. She started going to school at age 14, and of course, from a very young age, both her and her family sorta saw the signs coming and thought she might be destined for a religious life. That is until the age of 16 when she meets a boy named Pedro. Goes into a sort of weird amount of detail describing how they first meet when she was washing his feet at church. But Pedro is a person, he's sort of a family man, humble man of the soil. Patria gets attached to him, they get married pretty quickly. And also Patria notices how much Minerva is flirting with disaster by doing all this political stuff. She gets pretty nervous watching that. And then Patria has a miscarriage, a stillbirth actually. So the baby was pretty far along when it was delivered. And the book describes both Patria and Pedro going through a lot of grief from that, but then, quote, slowly I began coming back from the dead. What brought me back? It wasn't God. No, senor, it was Pedrito. His grief, so silent and animal-like, I put aside my own grief to rescue him from his, end quote. She sort of throws herself into her marriage, starts becoming a very dedicated wife. The book describes Pedro sort of losing it even more than Patria loses it, but they both do go off the deep end a little. There's one point where Patria thinks Pedro might have dug up the the baby's corpse, so she actually pays some workers to dig up the grave and make sure that the baby is still there. They open the coffin, they see the baby getting eaten by worms, and according to the book, she starts to lose her faith in God. And now back to Dede's point of view. Dede, of course, is the second sister, the one who survived, and the interesting thing we get in her point of view is it flashes between 1994 when she's being interviewed by that newswoman, and also one of the years prior when the main story of the book is still going on. On. So we get a glimpse of her talking to that newswoman and also talking to her nieces and nephews who are still alive. And then the interviewer asks her when did the problem start and she starts describing a boy named Leo Morales. Leo is a nickname, his name is Virgilio. And this guy was a little bit dangerous because he had some similar political ideas to Minerva. And he was recently back in the country he had been studying in Venezuela where he earned a medical degree. So the story describes the girls getting familiar with this guy, maybe some teenagers age flirtations going on. Leo and Minerva, of course, get close. Meanwhile, Dede meets another boy named Hemito. Until one day, their mom reads in the newspaper that Leo is a communist sympathizer, and she gets really freaked out by that. Dede, though, covers for her sister and helps her see Leo without the parents finding out. That's Minerva. And here's a quote about Minerva, quote, Minerva claims she was not in love with Leo. They were comrades in a struggle, a new way for men and women to be together. That did not necessarily have to do with romance, end quote. Leo, of course, gets tied up in an opposition political party that is just lambasted in the papers. Really, I'm surprised the party was allowed to exist at all. Meanwhile, things get more serious between Dede and Hemito. Hemito proposes to her. Hemito also very much cautions Dede to stay away from any political organizing. Things start to get real, though, when Leo gives Dede a letter meant for Minerva and asks her to deliver it. Dede opens the letter and reads it and finds out Leo wants Minerva to meet him at the Colombian embassy and flee the country with him. So instead of delivering that letter, Dede burns it. And then the book flashes over to Minerva's point of view, 1949. The year that Leo gave her the letter and fled the country was 1948. So 1949, Patria has two kids by now, Dede is married, and Maria Teresa is at school. Minerva still keeps in touch with Sunita, and she still is not married. Instead, she's trying to convince her father to allow her to attend university, which in the 1940s for a woman to do that would have been a pretty new thing at the time. Minerva feels very trapped at home, and this is where the reader finds out she probably would have fled the country with Leo if Dede had not burned that letter. And then, one day, Minerva happened to have been looking through a part of the house that she wasn't supposed to be in, and she found more letters from Leo, letters that her father was keeping and hiding from her. And through these letters, she finds out that Leo tried to invite 
invite her to leave the country, but that message never got to her. So she gets pretty angry. She runs off in a fury to go find Dad and confront him about this. And this is where the reader comes face to face with something interesting. It is something, though, that the mother had hinted at before previously in the book. Their dad, every day, he has a habit, a routine, of going out in the family car, one of the two family vehicles, and driving around the property, quote-unquote, just to go inspect things, quote-unquote, just to see how everything's doing. So every afternoon he would go do this. Minerva, though, can take an educated guess at where to find him. There is another family in the area with no father in the picture, and with a bunch of daughters that look mysteriously similar to the three sisters. Minerva takes the second family vehicle and drives to that house, and sure enough, Dad is there, spending time with his second family. And of course, they have a confrontation about the letters that the dad had been hiding from Minerva. Minerva and the father then again talk later that day about the new family, and Dad tells Minerva that he had since broken up with the mom, and now he only cares about his children over there. Minerva tells Dad that she would like to meet her half-sisters. We find out there's four girls, and she does the math in her head based on the age of the oldest one and figures out three of the four sisters, that is, Minerva, Dede, and Patria. Those three sisters were away at school during the time that the father must have started that affair. So she wonders to herself what was missing in her parents' marriage that her dad had to go out and find something else. She asks her dad why he did it, and his response was, cosas de los hombres, things that men do. Later on, the father gets an invitation to a fancy party in the capital. I mentioned earlier the property that he was supposedly going around. Well, he has a lot of land, he has a big farm, and he's getting to be one of the more well-to-do people in the country. So he's high enough profile that somebody might invite him to one of these parties. And lo and behold, along with the invitation, Trujillo wrote a request for his daughter Minerva to attend the party as well. So, of course, the dictator himself asks for this. We cannot in a million years refuse him. The father and Minerva decide to go, but they also decide that Patria, Pedro, Dede, and Jimito would also be going. Maria Teresa wants to go, but no, she cannot go. She's too young. And everybody knows what El Jefe is likely to be interested in as far as Minerva goes. Minerva is a 23-year-old woman. Trujillo is famous for his lust. The family is thinking about that, and the reason the sisters and their husbands are going are to try and provide support, or if they can, try to keep Minerva safe during this party. So they get to the party. Jefe, of course, invites Minerva to come sit with him him at his table. Meanwhile, Minerva's family has their own table across the room. During the dinner conversation, Minerva directly tells Hefe that she wants to go and study law in the capital. This is a bit of a bold move because she's going above her father's head here. Her father, she knew very well, did not approve of her studying law, but she's able to talk Trujillo into supporting it. Later on, after Trujillo asks Minerva to dance with him, they're talking more. Trujillo mentions that there's been problems with communists at the university, and Minerva accidentally has a slip of the tongue and mentions the name Virgilio Morales. This gets Trujillo's attention. Oh, do you know him? Oh, no, Jefe, of course, I don't know him. I've just heard his name before. But then, during the dance, Trujillo starts to put his hands in places that Minerva doesn't like, and Minerva actually slaps him. And at this point, just perfect timing, it starts to rain, everybody's running around trying to stay dry, there's a little bit of chaos in the party, and at that point, Patria grabs Minerva, and the family gets out of there quick. Minerva, though, leaves so fast that she forgets her purse is still at Hefe's table, and after they're already in the car driving, of course it's a three-hour drive between the capital and their house, she remembers at that point that sewed, hidden, sewed into the lining of the purse are some of the letters from Virgilio. It's not long after that we find out Trujillo, of course, is mad that the Mirabels left early. He wanted to spend more time with Minerva. The family is instructed to appear at the home of the local governor. The governor tells them that the father should go to the capital and beg forgiveness. And then, of course, it's insinuated, you know, Minerva, I believe there's a way that you can help your father in this situation. The governor saying something, hinting something along those lines. So, of course, Minerva and Mom also so go to the capital. The father is actually in custody at this point, so they're going to petition for the father's safety. So they get there, they go to the hotel where they're told the father should be staying, and they realize he's not there. They go to the missing person office in the capital. Of course, there's a long, long line, and of course, there's bribes involved in getting your request filed in this office. Minerva is seen while they're waiting in line. She's seen helping other people fill out paperwork in the missing person office. And there's a little exchange, quote, Miha, you're going to fight everyone's fight, aren't you? End quote. That's the mom talking, quote, It's all the same fight, I tell her. 
end quote. While they're in the capital, though, some of Trujillo's men come to fetch Minerva, and they bring her to an interrogator, who has gone through Minerva's purse and found those letters that she didn't want them to find. And he asks her, why did she tell Hefe that she didn't know Leo, when clearly you do, you have his letters in your bag? She tells him that she didn't want to displease Hefe. And apparently that was the right answer. The interviewer suggests that Minerva should go meet Trujillo privately to talk about her father and getting him released. Minerva actually refuses to do that. So meanwhile, they're given a three-week waiting time to see their father, and in the meantime, Minerva and her mother are not allowed to leave the hotel where they're staying. Other family has to come and bring them meals. And when they finally get their father back, he looks as bad as a three- or four-week prison stay in Trujillo's Dominican Republic might make someone look. Before they're allowed to leave, though, the family, all of them together, go to meet Hefe. And Trujillo and Minerva actually play a game of dice. It was Trujillo's suggestion. A game of dice over whether or not Minerva gets to attend law school. The dice are loaded dice. Trujillo knows this. Minerva knows this. Trujillo doesn't know that Minerva knows this. So there's two pairs of dice that they could be using on the table. Trujillo rolls the loaded dice. Of course, it's a favorable roll for him. But before he can stop her, acting naturally, of course, Minerva picks up the pair of loaded dice, pretending she's just picking up, oh, any old dice. Because, of course, she doesn't know their cheat dice. And she rolls those dice, and of course, Minerva and Trujillo have tied rolls. So because it's a tie, they decide that Minerva has to go back home. She does, however, from here on, need to check in regularly with that local governor. Meanwhile, Dede and Himito decide that they're going to try to start a restaurant in the capital. And there's also a scene where Minerva visits that other family and offers to pay for her half-sisters to go to school. The next chapter is Mate's point of view, so she's writing in that diary again. And it starts in the year 1953 and goes all the way up until 1958. Mate is 18 years old in 53, so a little bit of time has passed since the end of Minerva's point of view. The girl's father has gotten sick and passed away, and Mate writes in the diary that she's offended that all the half-sisters that Minerva still talks to have the gumption to come to the funeral of their father, when of course officially, officially, they're not supposed to have anything to do with that family. Minerva, in the meantime, she's been living her life, and one thing she did was, during some holiday or some event, she gave a particularly moving speech to honor Trujillo. Of course, that's not how she really feels. She just gave the speech because anyone who doesn't show public appreciation for Trujillo is going to be questioned by police. So she swallows her pride, gives that speech. Trujillo hears about it, and he finally grants her permission to go to law school. Before she goes to the capital, though, she has a trip planned to spend time in Harabacoa, which is a town in the mountains. It's a little bit south of Santiago, and the idea is she's feeling grief over her father's death, and she needs to go away to the mountains and get some fresh air and get away, and maybe she'll feel better. Meanwhile, she's been spending some time listening to illegal radio stations. During her time in the mountains, she meets a boy named Manolo, and they start a romance together. Minerva goes away to school, and she arranges it so that she studies during the week, and she goes home on the weekends to be with her family. Dede and Himito, in the meantime, are having trouble getting the business set up and getting the business to stay afloat. Remember, they were trying to start a restaurant in the capital, so they give that up and they move back home. And now in the book, the year is 1953. Maria Teresa was born in 1935. She's becoming a real heartthrob with the boys, first of all. But second of all, she's coming of age to go away to university and to study in the capital with Minerva. So she plans to do that. And meanwhile, the family finds out that the boy who's been tending the garden outside their house is an informant for the secret police, so he stops by the secret police station now and then, gets some extra pocket change, and tells the police what the family's been talking about. So they, uh, quote-unquote, promote this boy to working on the pig pen instead of the garden. So that way it's harder for him to hear what's being talked about in the house. Now, Mate being away at college, Minerva keeps encouraging her to study law. She tries a law course, and her heart really is not in it. It's not a subject that she enjoys spending time with, so she ultimately decides to go with philosophy instead. Meanwhile, she's been having a lot of nightmares about her dead dad. Minerva, during this time, finds a boy named Manolo, who is a sort of political loudmouth like her, and they end up getting married. One of the big events at the school during their time there is a teacher who gets caught saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. He is able to escape the country. He runs away to New York. And what does he do? He starts writing a book about the regime. Trujillo, though, has loyalists in New York City as well. They approach this guy, and they bribe him to stop writing the book. He refuses the bribe, and then soon after he is, uh, disappeared. The students at the school, though, they figure this out, and that ends up being a decent-sized piece of news. Minerva graduates in 1957, 
Jackson. She graduates before Maria Teresa. Mate, though, still is able to live with Minerva and Manolo in the capital. Now, here's the spicy part, though. When Minerva graduates with the law degree, the school gives her the degree, but they do not give her a license to practice law. And this is seen as a slap in the face directly from Trujillo. Now, Mate living with Minerva and Manolo notices that there's a lot of talking in code in that house. They use secret code words so that anyone listening in won't be able to know what they're talking about. Minerva does get pregnant and have a child named Minu, and she also tells Mate that Manolo has been having an affair. And now, one fateful day, a man shows up at the apartment with a big box of delivery for Manolo. Mate is there, but Minerva and Manolo are not, and as he's dropping off the package, he mentions in casual conversation, Oh, are you sisters with the Mariposa? Mariposa translation is butterfly. Mate goes and asks Minerva about this later, and Minerva starts explaining what we all probably would have guessed by now anyway, which is that her and Manolo are part of a national underground resistance movement against the regime, and they all use code names, and Minerva's code name happens to be Mariposa. Mate begs to join, she becomes Mariposa number two, and she ends up really throwing herself into it. She writes that all she can think about is the underground, not school. And as an added benefit, that boy who dropped off the package that one day, his name is Palomino. And Mate, being the one who receives the packages from now on, has a lot of opportunity to flirt with Palomino. They start a romance, and we eventually find out that Palomino's real name is Leonardo Guzman Rodriguez. Palomino's just a code name, of course. He and Mate get married in 1958, which leads us into the next chapter, that is Patria's point of view. Remember, she's the oldest one. The year is now 1959, and Patria has been married for 18 years now. Remember, she got married at age 16. The big event at the beginning of this chapter is Cuba Libre, or Freedom for Cuba. That is when Cuba gets, depending on your point of view, liberated by the Castros. For those keeping score at home, you might remember that the Cuban Missile Crisis with JFK happens just three years later in 1962. But for the underground in the Dominican Republic, the label of communist doesn't matter as much. What matters is they threw off the dictatorship of Batista, who is seen as being a similar oppressive tyrant to Trujillo. Patria in this year is actually pregnant, and she has an older son, Nelson, who is a little bit of a troublemaker, so Patria decides to send him to a priest school in the capital to get him out of harm's way. Minerva and Manolo, meanwhile, they bring their new baby to live with Patria, and the reason they give for this is they want the baby to be in a cooler part of the island. Remember, the capital is on the southern coast, and Ojo de Agua is up more central to the island, if anything, on the northern end of it. But they say the cooler air will be good for the child's health. And then they end up using that child, visiting that child, using that as a valid excuse to travel if anyone in the secret police ever stops them on the road and asks where they're going. Clever, clever. People who move things for the underground movement. Rumors start popping up of an invasion from Cuba being planned to liberate the island from Trujillo. And the rest of the family keeps being concerned about Nelson being overly enthusiastic because he's youthful and he wants to join the movement. So Patria at one point calls up the school in the capital and tells them to not let him go out exploring the city. Not only Nelson, but Minerva is offended at that, but Patria doesn't care. She wants her son to be safe. Quote, Thank the Lord I had that child in my womb to remind me of the life I had already chosen. End quote. Patria tries to resist all the revolutionary excitement going on around her, and she retreats into religion for comfort. She and her mom actually plan a religious retreat up into the mountains before the baby comes. And while they are up there, suddenly there start to be explosions on the building and in the mountains around them. The group of religious people end up hiding inside the church, the building. They huddle together, they pray the rosary together. And meanwhile, there start to be soldiers and rebels fighting all around them in the mountain. And Patria, during this, she sees a teenage boy who is, of course, a rebel. And she sees this boy get shot and die. And that, seeing that sort of makes fresh the emotional scar of having a stillborn baby all those years ago. Quote from something that Patria prays, quote, I'm not going to sit back and watch my babies die, Lord, even if that's what you, in your great wisdom, decide, end quote. And this becomes sort of the transforming event that fully gets Patria on board with the revolution. Now, I did look this up. The rebels in the mountain, in the book, they were portrayed as the Cuban liberators. I looked this up. Nonfiction. Cuba actually did launch a sea invasion. They, uh, they sent boats over to the 
Dominican Republic. Do you want to guess how many? They sent a total of 244 soldiers over. Total. That's all. That's all the people they sent. I don't know what exactly the goal was. Maybe the goal was just sending people who are able to train the local rebels. But in any case, they weren't able to successfully sneak onto the island. They were found after they landed. Almost all of them were killed. I believe the number is seven who survived. And I can imagine being captured by Trujillo under those circumstances was not a fun time. But back to the book, not only Patria is transformed by that experience, but her priest as well, who is an important figure both to the family and to the community. The priest is now fully on board with Revolution. And she stops resisting Nelson's desire to get involved as well. Her husband, though, Pedrito, is furious at this. He thinks it is too risky. And one of the reasons being, he has a lot to lose. The farm that he lives on is a family farm. It's been in his family for generations. And all of them know very well that if any of the family are caught doing revolutionary activity, one of the first things the government's going to do is confiscate that land. But nevertheless, Patria is eventually able to convince him, and Patria becomes Mariposa number three. The family then starts assembling weapons and explosives together right in Patria's living room. Which brings us to the next chapter. This one is Dede's point of view in the beginning of 1960. Dede has married Hamito, and Hamito has always been one to keep his head above water. He's been less on board with the whole revolution thing than a lot of the other members of the family, and Dede ends up sort of feeling guilty because she feels like she's using her husband as an excuse to stay out of all the scary revolutionary activity. She told everyone she wanted to obey her husband, which was seen as unusual in this particular family, quote, The Mirabal sisters like to run their men. That was the problem. In his house, he wore the pants, end quote. And, quote, her life had been bound up by a domineering man, and so she shrank from the challenge her sisters had given her, end quote. And this silent tension between that couple ends up growing so much that at one point Dede thinks that she's really going to leave Amito and go join the revolution without him. Let the divorce come if it may. All the sisters together have a meeting with Dede and end up talking her into that. But then Dede goes to the priest for advice, and in talking to the priest realizes that the priest is also involved in the revolution, even if he's not trying to to directly tell her. She realizes that she can't trust the priest's advice, he is not an unbiased party. And that realization actually is what convinces her to stay with Hamito. Hamito, though, he figures out that something is going on even if he doesn't know exactly what. So what he does is while Dede is away, he takes the kids, he goes to his mom's house in a large town, small city called San Francisco, that is San Francisco, Dominican Republic, not San Francisco, California. And all the sisters together get in the car and they go drive to meet him. So they have that big meeting, they end up cooling a lot of the tension in the family, and they end up deciding that Dede and Himito need a new honeymoon. So that's what they do. Meanwhile, this family cannot catch a break. In a predictable turn of events, the operation going on at Patria's house is busted. The house is raided, it's burned down by secret police, Nelson and Pedrito are arrested. And over in a distant part of the island, they also catch Minerva and Manolo at the same time. And in sort of an amusing twist, this is how their mother finds out that all the daughters are involved in a revolution. I don't know why nobody told her before, but there it is. It's at this point in the story we're introduced to a character named Pena. Spelled P-E-N-A, but the N has the little squiggle on top of it, the Enya. Captain Pena is the regional head of the northern branch of the secret police, abbreviated S.I.M. Everyone calls it the Sim. And he is the one who comes to arrest Maria Teresa. And now we come to a chapter from Patria's point of view. Now this one's interesting. It takes place January to March 1960. And for those keeping track at home, two out of the four sisters have been arrested, three out of the four husbands have been arrested, and Patria's son Nelson has been arrested. So at home it's Patria, Dede, and their mother. House is feeling a little bit empty. She's dealing with some pretty heavy emotions after having seen the house burn down. That happened when they arrested her husband. And she gets in the habit of praying to... Every household, of course, is required to keep a portrait of the Jefe Trujillo somewhere in the house. Patria gets in the habit of praying to this portrait, not worshipping Trujillo, but praying that he's able to find mercy in his heart and change his ways and become a good leader and be lenient towards her family, release her loved ones. The family has a hard time getting information from the government about their family members in prison. Peña says that Patria's husband, Pedrito, was offered freedom if he agreed 
agreed to get a divorce, but he refused that. At one point, though, they do find the relatives' names on an official list of prisoners from the government. This is seen as a good thing because the concern was that they would just disappear and never be heard from again. And around the same time, that same priest that got radicalized alongside Patria, the one that today talked to, that guy was arrested. The new preacher, though, in his very first sermon starts talking about inalienable rights, uh, based. And then they start realizing that in their church, along with churches all across the island, certain uh, bioluminescent individuals start popping up in the congregation, joining out of nowhere. Yeah, the government starts planting spies in these churches to keep track of what people say. Never heard about that happening anywhere else. And at one point, Patria gives an anecdote about some prostitutes that were paid by the government to start attending their church. They start acting promiscuous and trying to disrupt things in the church. The mothers and wives of the congregation are having none of that. They are quickly banned from taking communion. And meanwhile, on Patria's personal life, her prayers continue. She offers herself to God and to Trujillo as a sacrifice, as a replacement in prison for her children and her family. Now, funny turn of events, one of those half-sisters of the Mirabel sisters knows somebody in the right place at the prison in the capital, somebody with the right set of opinions, that they're able to make that connection and get notes and sometimes care packages in and out of the prison. They even get a list of items that the sisters want inside the prison and they try to get those items for them. Meanwhile, at home, they can hear spies in the woods just, like, chilling outside their house in the woods close enough that they can, they're trying to hear some of the conversations that go on inside the house. They think they're being sneaky, but they're making too much noise. They get found out. But they still have to act like they're being sneaky. So the family starts getting, like, passive-aggressive and playing jokes on them. They put chairs out there at one point, and they put a bucket of snacks out there. But the spies aren't polite with those. They just walk straight through the flower bed and leave cigarette butts out. They sneeze loudly in the woods, and Patria yells loudly out the window, God bless you. Now and then stuff gets stolen. Eventually, the family decides to start planting thorn bushes around in the garden, and at one point when the spies get bold enough to stand, like, directly underneath the window, they toss dirty bath water out the window. So after they start doing that, the spies start keeping at least some distance from the house. Now the 15-minute news cycle spins once again, and Trujillo suddenly decides that he wants to be seen as merciful. So he starts giving pardons out to women and children. Well, Nelson, who is Patria's son, he's 18 years old, so he's just, just over the threshold of being too old to qualify for that children pardon. So Patria and the mom have to brainstorm what to do about that. Meanwhile, Pena, that captain of the secret police, ends up buying the land that used to have Patria and Pedrito's house on it. That is a big slap in the face. And at one point, the family starts noticing evidence of hidden microphones inside their house. So they decide that the only place where it's safe to actually speak their minds is either walking outside in the garden or driving in the car. Quote, why give out the valuable truth to a hidden microphone, end quote. Patria at this point decides to go to the city of Santiago, which I, I believe it's about an hour drive for them. She's going to visit Pena at his office, and she's going to beg him to get a pardon for her son Nelson. So she gets the meeting with him, she gets down on her knees, begs him, oh, I don't know, and she starts praying right there in his office out loud praying for him to try and get this pardon. And I think of all the characters in this book, only Patria could have pulled this off. It actually works, and Pena does make a phone call to someone in the capital to ask about getting that pardon. Quote, Maybe because I was watching him so closely, a funny thing started to happen. The devil I was so used to seeing disappeared, and for a moment, like his tilting prism, I saw an overgrown fat boy ashamed of himself for kicking a cat or pulling the wings off butterflies. End quote. But despite him making that phone call, they're gonna need to wait and see if the right cogs in the machine in the capital actually get moving, if this pardon is actually going to happen. Quote, I'll pray for you, Patria says. What for? Because it's the only thing I have left to repay you with. I wanted him to understand that I knew he had taken our land, end quote. Meanwhile, in national news, Trujillo tries to cancel the Concordia with the Vatican and break with the Catholic Church, meaning basically the Catholic Church would no longer be the official state religion. And I looked up what I could nonfiction history about this. I found that in 1950, before Trujillo actually, that's six years before this, Trujillo actually went to the Vatican and signed that concordat, which, from what I understand, that actually did give the Catholic Church status of state religion at the time. However, in 1960, there was an open letter from the Church condemning the mass arrests of political opponents that were happening under the Trujillo regime. Now, again, I'm relying on English-language Google for this stuff, so I could not find a lot of solid historical sources for that. 
but those two things are the information that I can verify. But back to the story. They get a shopping list from Mate, who is still in prison. They would like books, they would like a dozen crucifixes, and they would like sewing materials because they want to be able to sew clothing in prison, children's clothing, and then send it back home for the children who are not arrested. And then we have a little bit of, a little bit of neighborhood politics. Patria and family get a visit from Peña, seemingly for no reason, seemingly just to be friendly and neighborly. But they've been hearing rumors around that all the farmhands who used to work for Pedrito, they know the story of what Peña did to that family, and so Peña is having a hard time getting hired help for his new farm. So he wants to be seen as being friendly with Patria, so that he can get a little sympathy back from her neighbors. But nevertheless, this visit is not for that singular reason. He brings with him visiting passes for the prisoners. Passes to visit the sisters, but not the husbands. And he also brings news that Nelson will, in fact, be pardoned. He tells Patria that the women women were offered pardons, but they refused them. And Patria, understandably, is confused by this, and doesn't know what to make of it, doesn't know whether to take that at face value. But nevertheless, despite feeling conflicted, despite not liking Peña at all, the family wants to be diplomatic and host a dinner party for Peña, as a thank you for getting those visiting passes and that pardon. Quote, I wanted to start believing in my fellow Dominicans again. Once the goat, the goat is a derogatory nickname for Trujillo, once the goat was a bad memory in our past, then would begin the real revolution. We would have to fight, forgiving each other for what we had all let come to pass, end quote. So they go to the capital on the date that Nelson is to receive his pardon, and they find who else but American news cameras there to cover the event, and Trujillo would with his best face for the camera, trying to counter international claims of human rights abuses. Now the story behind these pardons is starting to fall into place. On to the next chapter, March through August of 1960. This one is from Maria Teresa's point of view, and again is told through the pages of a diary, and this is where we finally get to get a view inside the prison, what's been going on in there. One of the first things she writes about is that the political prisoners were put in the same cell block, they, they share a big communal room, well not a huge communal room, but big enough, to house between 10 and 20 people, and they put the political prisoners in with the regular prisoners, so petty thieves, and people who've committed other real crimes. This is similar to something the Soviets did. They were fond of putting thieves in with political prisoners because they knew the thieves would be cruel to the politicals. Solzhenitsyn writes that in the 1940s, the political prisoners in Russia were very meek, very unassertive. They're easy to push around. They get referred to as rabbits a lot of times. And the thieves knew that they could push around these politicals and the guards would look the other way. Well, here in this book, we see in the beginning sort of an uneasiness between the two groups, but then given enough time, they do actually start bonding with each other, because rather than a much bigger camp like what they had in the Soviet Union, this one is a more intimate setting, a handful of people in the room, staying in that room all together for an extended period of time, weeks, months, being in the same room with the same people, having to take turns with the window. They are aware of men's only rooms and women's only rooms being in the same hallway of this building. This is La Victoria Prison. It's a well-known prison in the Dominican Republic. It's in the capital city there. Maria Teresa is suffering from asthma attacks. That's one of the reasons that the prisoners, when they were able to get a letter out, they wrote to the family and asked for medicine for that. Periodically, people from that room are pulled out for interrogations. Mate and Minerva are in there together, along with a bunch of others. And Minerva, of course, gets special attention from the interrogators. She gets pulled out more often than the others. And she's more prideful, more stubborn, more resistant during these interrogations. There's a point in time when Minerva organizes a time when all the women in the room would sing together every day. And they learn that not only does this keep their spirits up, the men in one of the other rooms enjoy hearing it. Minerva also comes up with three cardinal rules for everyone in their room to go by. Number one, never believe them. Number two, never fear them. Number three, never ask them anything. Which someone who's never been in that kind of a situation can take for granted. What are your sources of information? Do you trust the prison guards to give you accurate information? If one of them tells you about some disaster that's big in the news, do you trust that? 
how do you know what's really going on outside? They do get care packages from the family outside, and Minerva is all about solidarity. She makes sure that everyone in that room with them is able to share from the food that they get sent. Maria Teresa is losing weight, meanwhile. Minerva, ever on a quest to keep herself occupied, organizes a revolutionary school. Well, this just consists of all the people in their room, obviously. Every day at a set time, they get together and they talk about revolutionary concepts and ideas. We also learn that getting engrossed in ideology as they are, they actually were offered a pardon and they actually did refuse, because being that deep in ideology, quote, we've done nothing we need to be pardoned for, end quote. I'm not sure if I would have made that same decision. I tend to be a more practical thinker. But if this part is actually nonfiction, if, because I have no way of knowing, then I do believe they slept soundly at night after having made that decision. They, of course, get those 12 crucifixes that they wrote to the family and asked for, and everyone in that cell, even the prostitutes, even the people who don't believe in God, the people who you wouldn't think of as wanting to wear a cross, they wear it as a show of solidarity for the revolution. At one point, they start doing a hunger strike as well. The guards get tired of it, they confiscate the crosses, and they ban the singing. We learn that Leo has been segregated in a separate prison building, also in the capital, because Trujillo is trying to convince him to do a special job for him. We don't know what that job is. Maria Teresa, meanwhile, suspects that she may be pregnant. Quote, you think you're going to crack every day. But the funny thing is, every day you surprise yourself by pulling it off." End quote. The guards start encouraging the prisoners to take up hobbies, to distract them, to take up the time. Minerva takes up sculpting, she is able to sculpt a few things, and then we learn that there is an international group called the OAS that is going to come in and interview prisoners, and the goal of this is to assess whether or not the prisoners' human rights are being respected, and we're given to understand from reading the book that this group does have the authority to impose international sanctions sanctions on Trujillo's government. Now, I looked this up. OAS stands for the Organization of American States, and it consists of almost every single nation on North, South, and Central America, except for Cuba, Venezuela, and a handful of others. This organization still is around today, and reading off Wikipedia, they are a multilateral regional body focused on human rights, electoral oversight, social and economic development, and security in the Western Hemisphere. And, spoiler alert for the book, Trujillo's government is actually the first nation that the OAS does take action against. But back to the story, the prisoners hear about these interviews coming up. We also get a bit of international news. The Venezuelan president has accused Trujillo of orchestrating an assassination attempt. He says that Trujillo wanted revenge for him initiating the OAS investigations. Meanwhile, closer to home, Maria Teresa figures out a little trick. She's always had the biggest, poofiest hair of the sisters, and she realizes that she can hide things inside her hair when she braids it. The time for those interviews get closer and we start hearing details about the logistics of how they're going to do this. They're looking at interviewing one prisoner from each cell, and Mate is the one who's chosen from the cell that we're getting to see inside of. They figure that the guards chose Mate because she's the quietest of the group in that cell and they figure she's the least likely to say anything bad. They also realize and plan on the possibility of audio bugs, at least in the hallway, if not in the room itself where the interview is going to be held. So they plan on not being able to talk openly during this interview. Otherwise, later on, they're going to get punished. So the plan they come up with in their cell is to slip two pieces of paper in Mate's hair, two notes. And while Mate is giving the interview, of course she's going to say the right things for the hidden microphone, but the microphone is not a camera, so she will presumably be able to slip the note to the OAS interviewer without giving any audio clues as to what's going on. So they write two notes, and they hide them in Mate's hair. The first note, is a description of all the bad treatment they've been given in general in this prison. And the second note is something that specifically mentions which cell has written that note and passed it on. And Mate herself feels apprehensive because she knows that the second note will incriminate one of the guards who they've sort of become a little bit fond of. So while she's in there with the interviewer, she successfully passes the first note along, but she does not pass along the second note. It works. The OAS steps in and puts international pressure on Trujillo. 
and the political prisoners who are women are released, not pardoned. Which brings us to Minerva's point of view, August through November of 1960. Minerva now has house arrest after her release, and she's actually become a minor celebrity in her town because of what she did. She feels a little bit of pressure to keep the happy face on in public, but in truth she's having trouble adjusting. Meanwhile, Pena, the head of the Northern Sim, asks the sisters to write thank you notes to Trujillo for the release. Minerva, of course, doesn't want to write this, but then Patria is able to convince her that it would help get leniency if not a release for all of their husbands. Meanwhile, those guards who previously had to hide outside and hide in the woods and pretend that nobody knew that they were there, well, now that Minerva has to be on house arrest, they now have an excuse to come out in the open and watch Minerva. Meanwhile, one of Minerva's old school friends, her name is Elsa, she's able to get on Pena's good side and she gets permission to visit Minerva frequently. She's able to pass along news because she and her husband have a boat that they take quote-unquote fishing trips on. So they go out in the ocean, they sit on the boat with a radio, and they listen to all the forbidden radio stations. They find out that the OAS actually has imposed some pretty serious sanctions, and the Americans have closed their embassy. Meanwhile, Minerva is able to make multiple visits to Manolo in the capital. He is still in prison. The sisters notice that Trujillo, whenever he gives a public appearance, he acts quote-unquote like a cornered animal. The government appears to be nervous. During their visits with the husbands, they hear that the prisoners are being killed, well, just disappeared, one by one. And the husbands are under the impression that their time could come any day, they have no clue when. And this is the thing that gets Minerva back to her old self. She finds a new energy inside her to do political work, and she directs that energy towards finding a way to get all of their husbands released. So they start feeling around the people that they used to talk to within the movement. They meet with one of their contacts, who happens to be a doctor. They go see this person with the excuse of having a doctor's appointment. They find out that all the old cells are dead, all the groups that they used to know. They've almost all been found out. However, new cells are constantly popping up to replace them, so the turnover rate for these underground groups appears to be high. She schedules another meeting with a specialist doctor. Of course, we can guess what that meeting is. She gets Pena's permission to go to Santiago, that city in the middle of the island, to meet with a specialist. Finds out from him that the Americans who had previously planned to give a bunch of weapons to the groups that are planning revolution. They got jumpy because some of these groups were talking about communism, so they found different revolutionary groups on the island to give weapons to. And the ones that Minerva was friendly with, they were left high and dry. They hear second or third hand one time about something that Hefe said in one of his government meetings. He is reported to have said, quote, I have only two problems in this world, the church and the Mirabelle sisters, end quote. And Pena is reported to have jumped up and volunteered to take on the Mirabelles. The sisters, when they hear this, it's worth a good laugh to them because they don't even even go out much anymore except for doctor's appointments and prison visits. And then they get a piece of news. Patria's husband is still in La Victoria, but Manolo and Leo are being moved to a different prison, that is Puerto Plata all the way up north. The capital is on the southern coast, remember, and Puerto Plata is the place that is now a beach resort and tourist attraction all the way on the northern coast. So the sisters take a trip down to the capital to visit Pedrito, and then they make a plan to try and open up a store in Puerto Plata. So they have an excuse to spend a lot of time up there, and so that they're closer to the other men, that they can help them more often and more easily. Today, meanwhile, is worried and expresses concern about all three of her sisters traveling in the same vehicle at the same time. She says that it's too easy for the secret police to arrange an accident for them when they're all together like that. In the business, we call this foreshadowing. So after that visit with Pedrito, they make a trip all the way up north, going to Puerto Plata. They pick up a hitchhiker along the Way. The hitchhiker turns out to be a soldier and a Trujillo loyalist. Fun fun! He does, however, have something to do with guarding the prisons, and in doing that, they loosen his lips enough to learn a rumor that the men are going to be moved all the way back down to La Victoria shortly after they arrive in Puerto Plata. So this, if that's true, that would throw a wrench in their plan to make a store all the way up in Puerto Plata. But nevertheless, they arrive all the way up in that town, during the stormy season, mind you, and they successfully have a visit with their husbands. It's at this point that the narrative unexpectedly cuts off and we're taken to Dede's point of view. She finds out from various visitors 
pieces of information about the sisters' last 24 hours. These are people who have seen them during their last day in Puerto Plata. She finds out they left town around 4.30 p.m. They stopped at a store just outside of town, and then they kept going on that road south up into the mountain. Later on, a truck driver comes across their vehicle. He sees secret police have pulled them out of the vehicle and are harassing them, and that is the last anyone other than those secret police saw them alive. They are later found dead with their car run off a cliff, and the official story, according to Trujillo's government, is that they traveled during the dangerous stormy season and they had a car crash. Of course, anyone can guess at the truth. Trujillo, of course, is murdered the following year in 1961, and the next year following that, they have a trial for the members of the secret police who actually did the hands-on murder. And during this trial, they all point the finger at each other. They all claim to be the one who was on lookout duty while the others were committing the murders. However, the trial concludes and they all get sentences. And later on, after they're released, they start giving TV interviews about news and current events. They become sort of mini-celebrities on the island, and Dede can't really bring herself to care that much. The husbands, of course, get home, and of course they say they tried to convince the sisters not to go that day, they tried to convince them to stay in town overnight. The husbands were actually moved back down to La Victoria before they got the news of what happened to their wives, and we get a description of how they were told, quote, instead of the visitor's room, they were led downstairs to the officer's lounge. Johnny Abbas and Cundito Torres and other top sim cronies were waiting, already quite drunk. This was going to be a special treat, by invitation only, a torture session of an unusual nature, giving the men the news, end quote. So you can imagine how that went. After Trujillo dies, the country goes through a series of infighting and revolutions and many wars. Manolo dies in one of these conflicts in 1963. Today, meanwhile, sees herself as the reluctant keeper of her sister's life stories, and she becomes an enthusiastic caretaker for all the children that her sisters had. Hamito, meanwhile, moves to New York City for a while because money gets tight and it's easier to work in America and then send money back home to support the family, support the farm. Pedrito later on gets his land back. He remarries and he starts coming around to the family house less often. Leo gets out of politics and starts doing construction work. The kids grow up, they become teens, and then they become young adults, and then they start traveling, making their own way in the world. The mother lives until 1980. And then later on today describes a chance meeting that she has years later with Leo and what they talk about. Quote from Leo, The nightmare is over today. Look at what the girls have done. He means the free elections. Bad presidents now put in power properly, not by army tanks. He means the country beginning to prosper. Free zones going up everywhere. The coast a clutter of clubs and resorts. We are now the playground of the Caribbean, who were once its killing fields. The cemeteries are beginning to flower. To them, we are characters in a sad story about a past that is over." End quote. Now that line at the end, the line about being characters in a sad story about a past that is over, that one, of course to anyone reading this book, to people who read this stuff for entertainment, that can't help but feel like a little bit of a jab. But in any case, that conversation with Leo is where the book's narrative ends, so that's what we're left with. And now we get to make sense of what the author was trying to tell us through this story. Now I chose the very beginning of this video to mention that epilogue, the part where the author directly lays out her purpose for writing, says that she wants to try and convey the feeling of what it was like to live during this time, and on her rank list of priorities she puts the conveyance of that feeling above even accurately retelling historical events. I said that was a good choice, I still believe it. And even after recording this whole video, I'd come away with the feeling that even just the recording, even just all the little anecdotes that are sprinkled in there, they give at least some idea of that feeling. So in that way, I think she did a good job. The other thing she mentioned was trying to find the humanity, trying to find what made these sisters so courageous that they stood up to such a dangerous regime. Not portraying them as some super superhuman heroes, but portraying them as just plain humans. And that's something that even before I got to that epilogue, I sort of guessed at that the author was trying to humanize these overhyped national figures, trying to bring them down to earth without portraying them too negatively, just portraying them as people, as humans. I think she did a good job with that as well, although now I can't help but wonder, what were they really like? How close did the author get to actually showing them as they truly were? Julia Alvarez is also a woman writing from a female perspective, and I don't think 
quite the same flavor of story could have been written by a man. This story was meant for her to write, and she was meant to be the one to write this story. And I'll bring up a term that I coined years ago, something from when I put the lion's share of my focus towards making history videos on this channel. That is folk history. That's history that's not necessarily 100% accurate history that focuses more on storytelling than getting every single detail correct. And I said back then that the utility of folk history is spreading that story, and through lots of people hearing that story, through the story becoming popular, that gets lots of people interested in what the real history actually was. So now we have more people looking at this, and downstream from that we find out more about the past and what actually happened. This book is an excellent example of folk history in action. If this book were never written, well, maybe I would have known about the Mirabelle sisters, maybe I would have been curious enough to look them up. Up, because I did visit DR, Dominican Republic. I did see their faces on the money, I did see the streets named after them. Although I gotta say, without this book, maybe I would have been more curious to look up the three founding fathers than I would have been about the Mirabel sisters. And without this book, I certainly wouldn't have been able to find as much information about them. I wouldn't have been able to find enough to occupy an entire video's worth of time. And on the topic of putting people's faces on money and naming streets after people, a detail that stood out to me in the book is that at one point the capital city was renamed Trujillo City. I looked that up, that is actually true. He actually did name the capital city after himself. And the book also mentions that a bunch of the streets were named after his family members. So all these little factoids that I know about Trujillo's life, we have that, we have the role that his face needs to be in every home. If I remember right, I think he wore lifted shoes to make himself look taller. This is a guy who was really self-conscious about his image. That sounds like an exhausting way to live. And it goes to show you can have all the money in the world, all the power in the world, and still not be happy. Which brings us to my catchphrase, it would not be a B-list history book review if I didn't bring God into it somewhere. Don't worry, this one will be short. If you've been watching my shorts lately on YouTube, you might guess where this is going. Humans are social creatures. It is a psychological need for people to fit in with a group, for people to have good relations with the people around us. The purpose of human life on a psychological, spiritual level, what do we think the purpose is? Well, what did Jesus say when they asked him what the most important commandment is? He said, love God and love others. And he said those both at the same time because they are synonymous. When we show love to others, we are honoring God. That's how important this is that we serve others. The purpose of human life is serving others. We feel fulfillment, we feel happy in life when we do something that benefits others. That's just how human brains work. And now I'm gonna pick a few other books to compare this to. The first one is Slaughterhouse-Five. Now Slaughterhouse-Five is a book about someone who survived World War II, and then later on he survives a plane crash as well, and he never quite recovers psychologically from either event. By the end of the book, he truly believes that he's been kidnapped by aliens and put in a zoo so they can see what humans look like. And this character perceives time as being not exactly linear. His experiences as he perceives it are him jumping to random points throughout his life. He never knows what year he's gonna wake up as the next time he blinks his eyes. He could be back in the war, he could be working as an eye doctor fitting glasses for someone, he could be an old man sitting at home retired, you just never know. Now the author's purpose for writing that was to convey the feeling as well, the feeling of how disjointed it is dealing with that trauma, especially the element of trying to rationalize it and trying to escape it by living in some other world so to speak. So that, I think, is why, even though this book is much, much closer to non-fiction, Slaughterhouse-Five, I would say, is much more fictional. Even though Slaughterhouse-Five does have a lot of inspired-by-real-life events of the author, anecdotes thrown in there, that conveyance of the feeling is why I would say these books read very similar. I got absorbed into the narrative of In the Time of the Butterflies in the same way that I got absorbed into Slaughterhouse-Five narrative. I'll also compare it to Roots by Alex Haley. Now, of course, Roots is about the family history of an African-American. This family history was told through generations down by slaves, parent to child, parent to child, until Alex himself, he was in the right age group to fight during World War II. He heard this story from the older members of his family, and he started exploring it, started looking at actual historical records, 
started chasing actual historical documents. And then at the end of the book, he finds out he goes back to around the area in Africa where his family supposedly originally came from, and he finds a local historian there who's able to tell him, yes, here's the exact member of your family that was taken away to America. And he's able to successfully connect his American family with his African heritage. Reading that also felt really similar to reading in the Time of the Butterflies. And the author's purpose for writing that is to celebrate his family history and celebrate his heritage. Whereas in this book, I don't think Alvarez's main point was to celebrate the heritage, although there could be bits and pieces of that sprinkled in here. The main point she did directly tell us was to give a picture of what it was like to live in that time and place. And now, I cannot help but compare this to Gulag Archipelago, and I even referenced that book when I was talking about Mate's experience in La Victoria. Gulag Archipelago is, of course, the non-fictional account of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's time in a Russian gulag. One of the longest books I ever read, actually, but it's a Russian novel, so that's par for the course. And it's interesting, I'll say, to sorta examine the similarities and differences between how Trujillo ran things and how Stalin ran things, based off what we know from these two books. Stalin's Russia was a lot more locked down. The people were a lot more controlled. There was a lot more fear of speaking out. If one of your neighbors even said a word to the police, it doesn't matter whether you did it or not, the police were coming for you. Because the police didn't care whether you did it or not, they wanted to meet their arrest quota. And what is the crime that you supposedly did or might not have actually done? That crime would have been saying anything at all negative about the party or about Stalin or about Russia. Although I will grant the caveat, a lot of Gulag Archipelago was from the perspective of people who live urban. So I don't really know if someone living way out in the hinterlands in Russia in the 1940s would have had exactly that same amount of fear, but something tells me it would have at least been close. The Maribals, on the other hand, they do live way out in the countryside, granted in a nation with a lot less landmass than Russia, even if we're just looking at the European parts of Russia, still a lot less landmass, less population as well. But but still, Trujillo doesn't have quite that stranglehold on thought that Stalin did. People are able to talk with their neighbors and form groups. But then I also get the impression that Trujillo's regime had a lot less space in their prisons, so maybe not as much capability of throwing people in prison in those numbers. However, I did hear about a lot of political killings that the Trujillo regime was responsible for, so I get the impression whenever someone spoke out and said something that was bad enough, they wouldn't even bother with prison, they would just shoot him. Granted, Stalin also did a lot of political killings, but in Stalin's Russia we see hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in prison, to the point where prison labor becomes a necessary part of the economy and they need to bring people in to keep this part of the economy running even if those people are completely innocent. They need to fill that arrest quota, the work needs to be done. But even so, it took a long time before the people of the Soviet Union woke up to it. And even then, I'll say the Soviets had some soft reforms as time went on going into the 70s and 80s. Trujillo, on the other hand, they just killed him. And then after they killed him, the country had civil wars. So is there one one core factor that caused that difference in how these two regimes are viewed by their own people. It's probably more complex than just one factor I can name on a video. But now, one final thing I will mention before I end this video. You should go to church. Why? Because churches are usually one of the first things that oppressive governments start targeting. Dictators really do not like church. And why is that? Because churches help people to be less reliant on the government, more reliant on themselves, and able to depend on upon neighbors and the community and the friendships that they build in church. If one member of the church needs help, other people come in and help them out. Because you see these people every week, you genuinely care about them. It strengthens places on the community level, one small town at a time. Even if you're not sure about God, it's at least worth trying to go there, trying to be part of a community. There are lots of people out there who have had bad experiences with churches. Not all churches are the same. There's actually a huge variety of churches. There are churches that are really strict about holding each other accountable and helping each other to follow rules from the Bible that they would say, I would say too, improve your lives if you follow them consistently. But there are places that are really hands-off with it, places that certainly do talk about it, but places that don't look very far into your personal life. There are places that feel really structured, where you just feel like one face in the crowd. There are places where you walk in and you instantly feel like a family. You're instantly invited into all of the social circles. 
And of course, across all these places, there's different interpretations of what those rules mean, different interpretations of what's allowed and not allowed according to the Bible. So I really do think there's a church for everyone, and I really do think everyone should go to church and try to participate in their community in that way. And who knows, maybe if you do go, maybe eventually you'll hear the right thing and you'll figure out why so many people for thousands of years have had their lives changed by Jesus. But anyway, that's what I got. I hope you enjoyed the video. Have a nice day.